Welcome all of you in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, is there anyone here for the very first time attending the congregation? Very first time. We have few brothers. Oh, there's a lot of, lot of brothers. A lot of brothers. A lot of. We have some sisters as well. Uh, give a round of, uh, you know, welcome for all of them. Thank for all. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, brother. God, brothers, and God bless you, sisters. Uh, we'll have our, uh, uh, especially after. The service, we have a time of fellowship. We want all our uh, senior ones here to go, uh, you know, have a fellowship with the newcomers and, you know, get to know each other. 
because that's the work of the Lord as well, to understand and to relate with uh, our brothers and sisters who are coming for the very first time in our church. Um, I won't take much time getting into uh, a 20 minute sharing of the word, uh, an exhortation. I basically had no idea what to speak, no idea what to speak. I was really trying to figure out, Lord, I remember the last message I gave was on forgiveness and then Lord, what do you want me to speak this time? I was very, very confused. Um, absolutely not sure what to speak. And I got up uh, 4.30 this morning and I was sitting, uh, waiting upon the Lord, trying to read the word of God, trying to understand what is it that the Lord wants to share. And I happened to be reading also a wonderful article written by uh, one of the powerful men of God, Charles Spurgeon. Um, and he comes across one of the verses, Ephesians Five verse 20 and uh, 2 verse 10, sorry, Ephesians 2 verse 10. And then the Lord put this thought into my heart uh, to share this in the church today. Ephesians 2 verse 10. It says, For we are as workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We all have a lot of expectations, right? At home, there's a lot of expectations we have for the father, the mother, the children, a lot of expectations. If the expectations don't get met, you know what's gonna happen in the house. There's going to be some exchange of words, and in some houses you can hear screams and shout and uh, a terrible battle itself. We also have expectations in schools. If the kids don't do their homework, teachers would end up giving a punishment. It could be a warning, it could be a beating. I don't think they beat nowadays, right? You, uh, the kids nowadays are so lucky, but um, our times, we don't know how we were beaten up all the, the wood was expensive at that time because it used to break away very soon. So they used to make a lot more canes. Um, but anyhow, uh, there are different kind of expectations for children at school. At church, we have expectations, right? People who are taking up different ministries, there are expectations, and the church leaders look at, you know, are those expectations met? In organizations, we have expectations. If you don't meet those expectations, you can get fired, right? You can get a warning letter. After two, three warning letters, the next stage is called termination. You're terminated. So there are expectations. Now, if you are the boss of a workplace, you have a restaurant, or you have a shop, you will make sure to check all your employees meet those expectations. You will be very, very particular about it because you're paying them, right? You want to make sure they give the value for the money that they get as salary. But one question that we miss out in all of these expectations that we try to account, be accountable, you know, check the account of others. It could be our family members, it could be the coworkers, it could be our team. We make sure are they meeting their expectation or not. But one question we keep forgetting, and that is, what is the expectation of God for us? And are we meeting those expectations? That is a question we normally don't think about. You know why? If you start thinking about it, pretty much nowhere we are close to those expectations. So it is safer to ignore them, right? It is safer to put that at the back of your mind and not to bring it to the front because we become an utter failure. I'm not saying all, but most of us. And that's what the, the Lord was trying to help me understand this morning. What is workmanship? That in that verse, there is one word which says workmanship. What is that? Now, if you understand that in that particular context, in that particular verse, it says we are a product of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Father in heaven, created us, right? So we are a product. All of us here are a product of his creation. But very interestingly, if you see some of us walking around, we think we are the creators, right? Have you thought about it? Sometimes you see your, your boss walking around in the floor as if he created or she created everything under the sky. Sorry, we are just a product. Please understand that. That's very important. Though the Lord spoke to me today and said, Robin, you're just a product. I created you. That's it. You're not the creator. You're a creature. That the Lord created me. So we will look at 
a little more try to understand what workmanship is. No Christian in the world is a chance production of nature. Please understand that. No Christian in this world is a chance production of nature. Nature did not just produce us like this. No. We did not come into this earth by mere chance. No. Or we are not the outcome of evolution. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution or whatever theory out there, we are not an outcome of that evolution. We are the result of special circumstances. You and I are designed by the Lord even before you were born. Your parents were designed by the Lord so that you can come into existence. So it was not a chance. It was not a chance. You are specifically designed by the Lord, by the Father in heaven. Spiritual life cannot be born from nothing. It cannot be born from nothing. It cannot come to us by development from our old nature. Please understand that. Because one of the problems today is, we take credit for our spiritual growth. We, that's a mistake. You have a role to play. Please understand, you have a role to play, but you cannot take the credit of your spiritual growth. It is purely by the grace of the Heavenly Father. Purely by the grace of the Heavenly Father. See, when you start thinking that way, what happens is you will end up becoming very grounded. My spiritual growth is not my hard work. It's not my credit. It's purely by the grace of the Heavenly Father. Now please understand, it is the Lord that began the first stroke. You know, a painter, when a painter is painting his canvas or her canvas, there is this first stroke that comes. You and I began with that first stroke, but the stroke was the hand of our Heavenly Father. He's still painting you, but you have run away. We have run away from the painting thinking we are complete. We are not complete yet. The hand of the Lord is still at work. You believe that? The hand of the Lord, the painter, is still at work. He's still painting you. He's still making the product a lot more beautiful, a lot more, you know, in his own image, in his own will. But what happens is we run away in between thinking that we are complete. And this is where many Christians fall apart. This is where the spiritual arrogance comes. Thinking that I know everything about the Bible. I don't know if I've told this example. There was a sister that I remember. She started getting chances to speak at, at the women's meetings. She was just growing in the Lord. But the moment she started getting the chances to speak, she was dare enough, she would be very courageous to go speak. So that was a good quality in her. But the moment she got one chance, two chance, three chance, four chance, she started calling up pastors and telling them how to preach. And these are pastors who have been in the field for 30 years, 40 years, anointed servant of God. After the Sunday message, she would call them and say, Pastor, she started governing them and trying to tell them what to preach. And when it came to me, I told the sister, Sister, I think the direction you are taking is very dangerous. I take all what you say, but the direction that you are taking, the path that you have chosen is very dangerous. She is not here today to hear that. She left very early. Spiritual arrogance completely took over. Please understand, the Lord's hand is not taken out of your life. It is still at work. Allow the Lord to completely make who you are supposed to be in His image. Amen? It was the Lord who taught us that we need a Savior. When I read this, I was like, because sometimes we think, it is I who decided I need a savior, right? It is I who decided I need a savior. But please understand, it is the Lord who put that thought in me that I need the savior. It is important to understand. Because when you start thinking in that direction, what happens is you become completely dependent on the heavenly father. You take away this I and put it on the Lord. And he also put a thought in our mind that it is the Lord 
who can cleanse and wash your sin. It is the Lord. But the devil is working the other way around. He says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Last moment, you can just say a prayer, you will be saved. So the devil says, you can do it. But the Lord says, you need me to do it. That's the difference. And I had this wonderful time this morning while I was reading through this and trying to figure out, Lord, how can you teach me this in my own life? Every breath that I take, the slightest breath of spiritual life that works, that was ever breathed by anyone, came from God himself. I'll read it again. The slightest breath of spiritual life it may be very small, but that breath of spiritual life that was ever breathed in your life, please understand, even that breath came from the Almighty Father. So you don't have any credits to take that I deserved it, I got this. No, purely by the grace of the Heavenly Father. Please understand, if every Christian understands this, Imagine how the churches would operate, right? Imagine how brothers and sisters would talk to each other. There's going to be a whole difference. They will love, they will care, they will forgive, they will be united in Christ because they know that very breath they are breathing is from the Heavenly Father. You and I have no control over that breath. No control. It comes purely from the Heavenly Father. We must remain the Lord's workmanship. We must remain in that painting, in that canvas. I remember I was doing my studies in my teaching in Hyderabad and we used to have this lot of workshops, 21 day workshop, 30 day workshops. So there was this painter who came from Manipur. He was a very good painter. He spends like three to four months in Goa beaches painting massive canvases and selling those canvases. He's extremely good. So whenever he comes to our campus, our bed sheets are gone because our, we had this white bed sheet, so he would take those white bed sheets and you would start painting and the bed sheets are gone. But he was a nice guy. So one day when I was walking up to his room, I saw one of the bed sheet he took and he took that wooden plank, he put the wooden plank and he hang, you know, he, was, he put all the bed sheet over it and he started painting. And that painting took three weeks as we were there during that time. Every day you come, the painting looks a little different. From my mind, I would say, okay, beautiful painting. I thought the painting was complete. No. I come the next day, there's something else into the painting, something else into the painting, something else into the painting. And by the end of three weeks, the painting was just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. And when I was studying this this morning, the Lord brought me back this example and said, if I had taken that bed sheet on the third day and, and taken it to my room, imagine what painting I would have got. It would still be a painting. It, stood, it would still be beautiful, but not complete. Because the master is still at work. That is the mistake we make. We think we are complete. Please, please let's not get there. One of the problems with Bible college students is this. I myself am one. You have your certification, graduation, I think I know everything of the Bible. No. The Lord will still reveal mysteries from the word of God till the day you die. New learnings, new learnings. But we need to be open to his workmanship in our lives. Now, imagine if this painting was going on and I came one day and he is not around, I would take some of the paint and then start painting on it. What's going to happen? He would hang me with that bed sheet itself. Right? <laughs> That's what he would have done. Imagine somebody comes and takes a color and says, no, this color is good on this side and puts a color. That painting would get destroyed. And that is what today Christian brothers and sisters are doing for each other. We take that sketch from the Heavenly Father. And we start painting our own lives and we start painting others' lives thinking that I know everything of the word of God. It's a mistake. Allow the Lord. God can use us to influence each other. God can use us to help us grow. But do not do the work of the Lord that is only meant for the Lord to do. 
the human mind cannot comprehend the perfect design of a master the human mind cannot comprehend the perfect design of the master yesterday at the at the youth meeting i was asking a question what's the plan for 2019 professional plan so one brother said i'm not going to reveal the names they told me you know not to reveal any names so one brother said same 2018 i'll duplicate it for 2019 and the discussion went back and forth and then i asked okay what's the plan for 5 years what is the next 5 year plan and then we looked at what are the verses from the bible that contradicts long term plans just to understand it right we looked back and forth back and forth to study it and we asked one of the brothers why did you choose what you want what you're studying and he said according to my studies i'm not supposed to reveal that answer <laughs> so he escaped you know who that is right where danny is here <laughs> that was purely danny so long we were having discussions back and forth back and forth but please understand one of the things that we came to an understanding was whatever you plan should be in the will of god and you need to find that alignment first sit with the lord and ask lord what i am planning my studies my education what i want to do my professional life is this in your will get that match clear because if that becomes clear then the master is perfectly designing your life a well, wonderful time mr day now please make sure we cannot take the pencil from the master and design our future don't do that mistake let's not do it that would be the last thing that should be on the board it shouldn't be there at all in the first place the author must be the finisher of what he has begun allow the lord to do, to do those things in your life and when i was doing this this morning the lord was probably telling me directly don't take the pencil from the hand of the master that's the lord's work god can use you in many other ways but that snatching away the pencil from somebody's life and you drawing their future out we can make big mistakes let the lord do that have you ever wondered what an amount of patience the lord has on us how many times you snatched those pencils from the lord and started sketching your own future and every time you did that the lord gave that pencil to you but he was there patiently waiting that you will return the pencil back to him what an amount of love he has imagine if it is any one of us somebody snatching the pencil from us we would just leave and go we would say let him perish let him die we would use all those kind of statements and we would just go away but the lord was patiently waiting and his love for us was never dying it was just unconditional what an amount of grace god has spent on our lives 30 years 40 years 50 years 60 years 70 years 80 years just waiting that we will give him back the pencil so that he can sketch our life and as i was reading this i was saying lord maybe there were times that i took it off from your hand thinking that i know it a little more but today lord i give the pencil back to you i give that sketch back to you you design me you design me in whatever way you want me to design to be designed you design me and in all this time when we snatched he was graciously graciously enduring every opposition that we were putting in front of him maybe sometimes we used the very word of god to snatch that pencil we are good at that as many of the jewish uh, uh, you know teachers rabbis were very good at finding shortcuts we were very good at that but the lord says the lord was waiting patiently with all those opposition just to make sure that we don't get destroyed by sketching our own future day after day year after year he's looking for an opportunity to complete his design for our lives with an undiminished love even now as you are seated here 
probably the heavenly father is waiting that you will return the pencil back to him if you have taken it or if you have not given him the complete control to design your life heavenly father is probably waiting to hand it over back to him so that he can design your life what is our role in this what are we supposed to be doing one adore him for all he has done in our lives no amen for that adore him for all he has done in your life for all those things he has done in our lives until now right now as you're seated here every single thing he has done in your life adore him for that do not be worried about the incomplete picture that's a challenge many of us are worried about that incomplete picture and you're thinking you're this is what the lord wants you to be no hold on the hand of the lord is not taken off from you from your life from your family from your future it is still at work adore him adore him for whatever picture he has designed as of now whatever he has given as of now adore him for that many a times what happens is we crave for more this is our problem we crave for more the greediness that comes into our lives somebody is blessed we don't like it we want to be blessed somebody has been given you know a new car and i'm on a bike you know all this jealousy going in adore the lord for the bike in the first place that brother would adore the lord for the car that the god has blessed him with so adore what the lord has done in your life adore him right never number 2 never let us be ashamed to let men see god's workmanship in us never be ashamed to let other people see what god has done in your life because it's god's workmanship god has designed you till now god has created you till now god has you know beautifully painted your life please do not be ashamed of showing that to others revealing that to others sometimes we are even ashamed to call ourselves as believers right today's world is very different corporate world is very different out there if you say you go to church on sunday they'll be like laughing sunday is a time to party family do everything else outside you go to church in the morning it's becoming that world outside kids are facing it more than us in schools they're pulled they're made fun of for saying you know believers but please don't be ashamed of it don't be ashamed of it i was ashamed for a long time for a long time to say you know i believe in the lord i believe that jesus died for me i believe that jesus resurrected i believe mary was a virgin i was ashamed of telling those things but i really did not understand that i am perfectly designed in god's workmanship do not be ashamed you know bible says matthew 5:16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven let your light shine don't hide it don't put it under the cot let it shine whatever god has done in your life let it shine to others if god if you went through a struggle and god delivered you from that struggle share it with others that's a testimony so people can glorify the name of the lord i'm going a little faster 3 and 4 just two more points and we close let your meekness kindness uprightness integrity purity appear unto all men that is what you're supposed to do when god is still working on you when god is still designing you when god is still perfecting you in his image please understand what are you supposed to do meekness kindness uprightness integrity purity let it be appeared unto all men it doesn't say preach about this practice live that life because when you start doing this you don't have time for jealousy you don't have time for gossip you don't have time for backbiting why because you are busy focusing on your purity you are busy focusing on your kindness you are busy focusing on your integrity you see that that is what the lord wants you and me to do while he is still perfecting me and the last one don't forget 
that we are created in Christ Jesus. If you look at Ephesians 2.10, can I have that verse up? Ephesians 2.10. Can somebody read it loud? Created in Christ Jesus. Please don't forget that. We are created in him to do what? Good works. And what are those good works? The Bible is full of that. And the Lord was telling me this morning, your focus should be on the good works. And your focus should also be that, that you are created in Christ Jesus. In the image of Christ. We have gotten the best, best advantage here. And that advantage is we are created in the image of God. No other creation is created in the image of God except you and me. Except the human beings. When we are created in the image of God, we need to be doing the work of God. We need to be busy in the good works. And when that is happening, the Lord will be able to design you a lot more beautiful, a lot more perfect. There is no better example than Christ himself for good works. While he was on this earth, he set an example what those good works are. I'm not going to go into that. We are aware, we know the life of Christ. I would want you to go reflect on his image day to day. Every day in your life and see what is that good work from Christ that I can replicate today in my life as God is still busy designing me. Please understand, you are not complete. No one here is complete. We are still continually being made. And make sure the sketch is in the hand of God. It's not in our hands. It should be in the hand of God. Let God bless us with this word so that we grow to be in the image of Christ. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this bright morning where we could all come as one family, Lord. What a joy to be part of your body. Lord, thank you for the head and that is Jesus. You alone are the head. You are the Lord and the master of our lives, of the church. Lord, we submit to your Lordship this morning. Let your will alone be done in and through of each of our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 There's a wonderful verse in the Bible which says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. I'll read it for you. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. The Son of Man, that is Jesus, came. Jesus came. But John 3.16 says, and God gave. So Father God gave and His Son Jesus came. Okay, And Father God gave His Son Jesus for us. And Jesus gave his life for us. And why did the son come? He came to seek. First is seeking. Going in search of somebody. Who? The ones who were lost. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And who is the lost? Anyone lost here? <laughs> okay. We were all lost. We were all lost in sin. But thank God someone came after us. In today's world, okay, we are so busy. We don't have time to go after anyone. And we don't bother about it. We don't care. The today's generation is, who cares? <laughs> we don't care, okay. But he cares. He cares. That's why he came all the way in search of us and found us and saved us. That's it. Okay, that's a beautiful verse. And uh, today morning, I want to just take you through a chapter in the Gospels. It's from the Gospel of Luke again. It's in chapter 7, one of my favorite uh, incidents in the Bible. Maybe I have preached this sermon hundreds of times, okay, 
all over my life okay but today morning i just want to go to that chapter again it's uh, luke chapter 7 and verse 36 onwards luke chapter 7 verse 36 onwards the heading in some of our bibles are there for that uh, paragraph what is that jesus anointed by a sinful woman <laughs> it is jesus who anoints us <laughs> but here a sinful woman still she has been referred as sinful woman <laughs> so this sinful woman comes and anoints jesus and what's the text one of the pharisees asked him to eat with him pharisees called jesus to have supper with him if a pharisee calls you for dinner will you go yesterday a couple took us for dinner we went <laughs> we don't have to think twice because they are they are our dear ones but here the pharisee these pharisees okay they were not fond of jesus they were always after jesus not because they loved him they always wanted to catch him because these pharisees always thought they were so religious they were so spiritual and they were always finding fault with what jesus was speaking and sometimes even he was doing even they even found fault with his disciples hey your disciples are not doing this you're not not doing that okay they're not observing the sabbath okay they're not fasting they're not so every time pharisees always were looking for something but such a pharisee when he called jesus for dinner jesus went that is jesus we will only go to houses where we are comfortable with am i right we will only associate with people whom we love or at least they love us <laughs> but here jesus when he was invited he went that's it so wherever jesus is invited he goes when we sinners when we invite jesus into our hearts he came he came jesus came to us not because we were his children we were enemies we were sinners and when we invited him jesus come into our heart come into my heart and the moment we pray that prayer jesus came so wherever jesus invited he goes so when he went there okay and took his place at the table okay he was invited there for dinner so he went and sat on the table to eat suddenly next words and behold a woman of the city who was a sinner why would you brand someone as a sinner a woman of a of the city who is known as a sinner that sinner woman came and what should he do when she learned that he was reclining at table in the pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of ointment flask of ointment i too have brought a flask but that's not a flask of ointment it's hot water <laughs> here when us my version is very interesting my nlt i'm reading from when a certain immoral woman from the city heard that he was eating there she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume expensive perfume when she came to know that jesus was coming into such a such house to eat he immediately thought i should go and see jesus so when she came to see jesus she didn't just come like that she took something with him and what was that an expensive costly oil uh, perfume that's what is called perfume unfortunately in today's world perfumes are not very costly if you go to kunnal supermarket down you can have 60 rupee worth of lot of perfume and now they have this pocket perfumes it's only 60 rupees i bought some last week <laughs> it is good to give a gift to somebody okay earlier only this gulf people used to bring perfume so you were very known for your perfume so i have long to get a perfume and that was the best perfume that they prophesy that is not a name of a perfume and and i still remember i the first perfume i got actually was an empty perfume perfume bottle so i managed to put some water inside shake it and i used to use it and go to school and people still that water it it was really good smell and people is what what I, from gulf i got it but how can i say it is not perfume it is only water <laughs> so there was a time we were long to have a perfume 
The way you smile means it only applies to me. <laughs> I know many people who have put water in the perfume bottles. <laughs> Am I right? And I still remember one of my cousin's sister. We went to the death of my uncle. And there, this Udiclon was there for the dead body. And she wanted to make sure, don't finish it, I want to take it. <laughs> because she was in college at that time. And I, I, as a small boy, I managed to get that little leftover of the perfume and put it in the pocket and gave it. Kundu, amamai, kundu, kundu. And she used it till her marriage. Okay? <laughs> that was the Udiclon which was used for, for the burial of my <laughs> uncle. Okay? So, now we got the point, okay? Oh, great, the point. Great. <laughs> so, but what, why did I say all these things? The perfume that I am talking about is not very expensive one. These are cheap ones. But here, this woman brought this very expensive perfume. It was worth the, 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 her wages for many months. And what, what, what she doing, we don't know. <laughs> but it was actually, you, you earn for a long, long months actually. You just keep all your salary of many months and then you go and buy a perfume. So that much expensive, you calculate your salary, brother, and uh, three months salary, six months salary, and how much will come, and that much expensive it is. Okay, so such expensive perfume, she brought it to Jesus. Remember, she's a sinner woman. According to the world, she's a sinner. But when she comes to Jesus, she knows, He is Lord. He is the lover of my soul. And He is worthy. So, I cannot go empty-handed. I need to take something with me. And what should I take? Can I get something from the bakery? No. Then what? <laughs> she took the most expensive thing with her and went to see Jesus. I'm going to relate everything what she did from hereafter to Jesus. And I'm going to say, school of worship, okay, I'm going to relate with worship. When you come to worship God, this morning we are all come here to worship God. Remember, when you come to worship, don't come empty-handed. You are coming here to offer the costliest thing, the expensive thing, the which something which you treasure the most, and which what you are holding close to your heart, put it at the altar and worship. Maybe it's close to you, that's precious to you, but the safest place for your precious thing in your heart to put is at the feet of Jesus. And that is worship. That is worship. Remember, when you love somebody, you give your best to that person. Am I right? Because you love your children, you give your best to your children. So, because we love Jesus, we give our best to Jesus. And that's our worship. That's our worship. So, what are you holding close to your heart? Keep that at the feet of Jesus this morning. So, this <clears throat> woman brought the expensive perfume to Jesus. And then, how did she come? 38 words. She knelt behind him at his feet. She came, other version says, she came behind. Malayalam says, Aval amande paragil vannu. When you are bringing something costly to someone, you don't have to come behind that person. Because you are bringing something expensive, costly. Why should you... Be apologetic about it. Okay? You can come boldly to the friend and, hey, I brought something. When you go and give a check to the chief minister's relief fund, one lakh rupees from the new church, how will you go? Will you go just behind and say, I know you will wear your suit and you will get the camera and you will get even the channel reporters and all, then only you will go and give. And next day paper, you make sure it comes. So and so gave one lakh rupees to the relief fund. So when you give something expensive, okay, the junior church children can go to the junior church, okay. Okay, so when you give something expensive, you won't go behind kneeling and things like that. What does that show? When you worship, this should be your attitude. You should come with humility. You will come with humility. That means, simply means, Lord, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. You are worthy. And thank you, Lord. You chose me so that I could come and offer my sacrifice to you. So every time when you come to the altar, or when you come to worship God, you should always think, Lord, I was never worthy. Come to the feet of the cross. Just, that's what, there's some old, beautiful English hymns, just as I am. 
I come. So just as you are, come. But come with this attitude. What is that attitude? That attitude of humility. Okay, kneeling down, bowing. Okay, because you are not worshipping anything which you have or even which you are. Many times, okay, that's what the pride of life simply means boasting in something which I have and who I am. That's the pride of life. So when you come to worship, okay, bring that pride and put it at the altar. Lord, whoever I am and whatever I have or possess, I put it at the altar. So come behind kneeling. That's it. Worship is humility. Number one, worship is expensive. How can I offer something which is cheap? There's a verse in the Old Testament. How can I offer to God which doesn't cost me anything? Does your worship cost you something? I want to ask you a question. What did you pay to worship God? Sometimes you didn't sleep at all yesterday night. You were having VC. You were sitting up all the time. Till 6 o'clock you were sitting in your bed. But at 6 o'clock you felt a little relief. You saw the watch. Let me go to church. And you climbed all the stairs up. Actually you are sacrificing something. You are paying for it. Somebody told me last week. One of the ashas told me. When I see these uh, elderly mothers coming to this church, climbing these two floors, and many of them have rods, steel rods and uh, screw and <laughs> plates and everything. With all these, they climb the steps and come here. Why do they come? They can easily sit at home, give an excuse that, I'm not well, I cannot climb stairs, I have VC, I have heart problem. But they come. What is that? They pay. They sacrifice because they know. It's not when everything is fine you worship God. Even when everything is not fine, still you choose to worship God. And that worship, God will be so pleased. How many get that point? I don't even feel, sometimes there are times where you feel, don't feel like worshipping. Am I right? Sometimes you don't feel. Sometimes everybody will be praising, you don't feel like praising. That's okay. Even God understands that. God understands. Sometimes you, you don't feel like praying. That's okay. I would say, that's okay. <laughs> Can you get angry with God? Men in the Bible have got angry with God. <laughs> you know that? People have got angry with God. And that's also written in the Bible. Sometimes there are times, but still if you choose to say, Lord, still I love you. Still I choose to praise you. Still I choose to worship you. That is sacrifice. Coming through the back, kneeling down. And then, what did he say? Weeping. Weeping. What does that show? What does that emotion show? Weeping. When do you weep? Many times we weep for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Have you ever wept at his feet? Have you ever wept at your prayer time? Have you ever come to Jesus and wept? We talk about Jesus wept. That's right. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. But have you wept? When was the last time you wept? Weeping is not just crying again. You're weeping. When do you weep actually? When we come to God, okay, there should be a, that weeping. When you see the souls perishing, have you ever wept? Think about the people whom you don't know. Think about the people in your family, in your own family who are yet to come to the Lord. They are not saved. Where are they heading to then? If you are not saved, where are they heading to? Eternal? Hell. Where are you heading to? Heaven. How selfish are you? You going to heaven and your unsaved husband going to hell? Or maybe your unsaved parents are going to hell? Have you ever wept for them? Today make it a point. For all your unsaved letters, weep, weep, go to God and weep. That is the best worship that you can offer to God. Lord, I come, I weep. Then after weeping, what should they do? Her tears fell on his feet. She wept to that extent that tears came not crocodile tears, real tears. It came and it fell on his feet. 
Many times we go and cry and our tears fall on people's feet. Sometimes we go and plead with people, we go beg and we... Many times, okay, it is your futile. It's yet God has taught me very clearly, don't go and cry before people. I don't want to go into details. The last two months maybe, at least if November and December. I really was, I was, I was pleading, I was, I was telling, please give me one chance. I need to do something. Please give me one chance. I need to explain everything to people. I want to tell the truth to everybody. Let the whole world know the, what is the truth. <laughs> and I was telling, give me one chance, give me one chance. Do you know what happened? God didn't give me that one chance. <laughs> I never got that chance. God didn't want that chance for me. I didn't understand. I was very angry with God. Lord, why? Today, I'm glad that I didn't get a chance to explain. You can't explain everything. You don't have to explain everything. Because when God knows you, why should He explain? So, instead of going and shedding our tears before God, we go and shed our tears before people, expecting their sympathy. Expecting their help. But many times God won't allow that. God won't allow that. So she cried and the tears fell down at his feet. And when she saw that, she wiped them off with her hair. What did she do? She wiped them with her hair. Sisters, you wipe your hair, am I right? <laughs> when your hair is wet, you wipe. And you wipe it with a neat towel. Am I right? But here, and also you know that uh, how much you really struggle to keep your hair <laughs> clean. But now, when the feet is uh, wet and it is dirty, and in the, those time, remember, Jesus was not wearing a poor shoe and socks and everything and walking in the carpet and uh, uh, traveling in an AC car. <laughs> He was just walking in that place. And it was very muddy and it was all there in his feet. And when it, the, it was wet, okay, other chelly eye. And she goes. I'm sure that she might have a kerchief or hanky or shawl or dupatta, anything she might have. But she didn't take any cloth. And for a woman, your hair is your glory, am I right? But the something which is glorious for you, she went all the way down and took her glory and wiped his feet. Again, what is glorious for you? Bring it to his feet. Bring it to your feet. And she wiped. She wiped it. And then the next verse says, Then she kept kissing his feet. When she came all the way down to his feet and started wiping, the feet were so close, then she couldn't contain. She started kissing his feet. What does that show? What does that show? Whom do you go and kiss? The ones whom you love. So worship should be out of love. Even without love, you can still sing songs of worship. <laughs> Even without love, you can play the keyboard. Can I know something? Even without love, we can lead worship. School of worship, first of all, be lovers of God. And let that love flow as worship. Many times, okay, without love, we worship. And that will be a dry worship. So let our worship be out of love. And then, the problem is, then she put perfume something which is so costly, she put it at his feet. Now my question, how many of you use perfume here? Oh, all are very holy people on Sunday morning. Yeah. Have we ever took a perfume and put... Itu vare aru uttitilla kaalu perfume. Kaalu vella koyam puttitondu vache. Arum perfume uttitilla. Why? It may be precious for you, 
but the right place for your precious thing is at the feet of Jesus. She is doing everything at the feet. Did you note the point there? She didn't go and hug him and kiss him. No. She is kissing his feet. She is crying at his feet. She is wiping his feet. She is doing everything at the feet. Remember, that is pure worship. That is pure worship. Going and falling at his feet. Hugging his feet. Kissing his feet. Weeping at his feet. Wiping his feet. Everything at the feet. That's worship. That there be a radical change in our worship experiences. Going and kissing his feet and putting perfume. And suddenly the scene changes. The Pharisee, this guy, the, the host, he got so annoyed. Annoyed. What is this? We all know that who this inner woman is. At least I thought this man will be a prophet discerning who this lady is. But he is allowing everything for her to do. <laughs> and then Jesus knew what he is thinking. I am cutting short. Simon, his name is there. The funny thing is, okay, this man, the Pharisee's name is there, but this woman's name is not there. <laughs> she is still called as sinner woman, sinful woman. But this man, Pharisee, has a name, Simon. Simon! Did you see this woman? Yeah, I am seeing her. Simon, a story. <laughs> what is that? It's two debtors, big debt and small debt. Both were cancelled. Who would love more? What a question. The one to whom the biggest debt has been cancelled. So what was Jesus trying to tell? You love me and you think maybe a small debt of yours is cancelled. But she loves me more and you are irritated by that love. Why? She knows how much I have cancelled her debts. Do you and I know how much God has cancelled our debts. The more we understand what a wretched sinner we were, the more we will be thankful to God. We have a problem, especially if you are born in a Christian family, you have a problem. Especially when you are born in a Pentecostal family, and even especially if you are born to a pastor's family, you have a problem. <laughs> I'm not that. Oh, two pastor's sons are here. <laughs> A.B. and Robin. <laughs> yeah, we have this problem. <laughs> we think that we are not. Oh, <laughs> No. Equally, whether you are born in a Pentecostal family or a Hindu family, no, we were all sinners. We were all sinners. But thank God, God had mercy on us and forgave all of our sins and saved us. And that's why we worship. So worship should be expensive. Worship should be out of humility and brokenness. Worship should be out of love. And all these expressions of worship, odd expressions, your worship can be expressive. Don't worry. Don't think this is a decent church with no expressive worship. No. This can be a very indecent church with expressions of worship. <laughs> In English service, we are very decent, okay? <laughs> Sometimes English, English men are very decent. <laughs> but when we come to church, you can be indecent in the sense you can express your love. That's it. In whatever way you want to express your love, express it. God will be. In whatever way your child comes and expresses his or her love to you, you enjoy. And you take <laughs> the photo or video and you post it on this. Hey, do you know what my child did today? So every action, everything what your child does, you are so excited. How much more will our Heavenly Father be excited by everything that we do, showing that how much we love Him? And how do we love, do that? Matthew 22. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you know that. Love God. Okay, then? Love your neighbor. So when you love your neighbor, you are fulfilling the greatest commandment of loving God. That's why I love you, brother. Brother, you, are, you don't deserve to be loved. And even I am not lovable. But we both will love one another. Why? Because we both love God. Because we both love God, we love one another. Many times we don't love one another, instead we hate one another. That's what is happening in the Christendom. Remember, that clearly shows 
how much we don't love God, how much we are not thankful to God for what he has done. So this morning, can we say, Lord, thank you. And this is the, the expressions of worship. And finally, there is a result of worship, the last words. The last words. What is the last words in that chapter? 50th verse. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the result. What is the result? Peace. Remember, how did she offer her worship? There was a lot of expressions, actions, tears, love, everything was there. But Jesus didn't see the tears, the, the kissing or the perfume or anything. Jesus saw the faith in her. And that's what Jesus said. Woman, your faith has saved you. So worship should be out of faith. So without faith if you worship, even your tears, even your perfume, even your, <laughs> all your expressions are sheer waste. Why? Because Jesus is looking whether you are doing everything out of faith. The Christian life is full of faith only. It's all about the faith. It's not of the feelings. Christian life is not of feelings. Many times we are mistaken. During worship also, our feelings come first and we, we are very much happy. Oh, you know, I feeling here that any worship will be in another feel. I don't know. Don't be deceived, okay? Feelings can definitely misguide you. Put faith first. Don't put the cart in front of the horse. <laughs> Let the horse be put in the front so that the horse can pull the cart. So put faith first. Let faith pull everything. Don't put your feelings first. Even put your sight down first. Let everything follow. Let faith lead you. And the result of worship is, daughter, go in peace. So after a time of worship, do you feel the peace inside? Again, I use the wrong word. Do you feel the peace? You don't have to feel the peace. Okay? You will have peace inside by faith. If you, have re if you really love God, and if you really worship Him, Definitely there is a result of your worship. What is that? Peace. Today we will come to worship and go in pieces. <laughs> but if you really come and worship God, you will go in peace. So today, do you want to go in peace or in pieces? That all depends on <laughs> how you worship Him. So school of worship, I think I took one session. You have to pay me. Tomorrow your first session is cancelled. You can take off. Okay? Because tomorrow's first session, pastor already took in the church. Okay? So, will I be the faculty next time in your school, brother? Oh. <laughs> One of my favorite subject is worship. So, even though we laughed, it gives a lot of sense of the story. So, can we be like that sinner woman? We cannot boast of anything. We cannot boast of anything. Our reputation is still a sinner woman. A sinner saved by grace. That's why Paul says, Among the sinners, I am the chief. Like chief pastor, chief minister, chief sinner. Who is the chief sinner here? <laughs> Many times we, are, we fight for chief position. Yeah, there is a chief position waiting. What is that? The chief of sinners. If Paul didn't have any problem admitting that, what is our problem? What's our problem? We all want, I'm the chief saint here. <laughs> I'm the chief saint and you're all fellow saints. No, Paul says, I'm the chief sinner <laughs> and you're all fellow sinners. <laughs> what does that mean? That attitude should be there. Lord, only by your grace I'm saved. I cannot boast of anything. So let me come and worship you. Can we close our eyes? And with that attitude, can we come to Jesus? Can we come to Jesus? Can we come to Jesus? I want all of you to open your heart and say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Can you say it from the heart? Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Say it. Say it from your heart. Open your mouth and say it. Whatever your heart says 
say it from your mouth also whatever you believe in your heart confess it with your mouth also hallelujah hallelujah don't you brother to come forward and pray a closing prayer hallelujah hallelujah can we pray for the next service and the little hearts which going up okay shall we pray shall we pray for all the worship services going around in the city of trivandrum everywhere all the congregations all the pastors all the missionaries shall we pray for every work that is going on in the city can we thank you lord thank you lord for this wonderful time of worship and wonderful word that was shared with us lord when we go out from here lord let your light be lit on us amen and let us truly li- truly shine in your light amen. let us truly glow in your light amen. and when the people around us when they look at us let them see you yes. let them see mirror images of jesus lord yes. and let us carry your presence wherever we go throughout this next week and let it not end here lord let it carry till the next week and over and over lord thank you lord bless the rest of the services lord lead each service lord have your way upon your children lord lead your children guide your children in the name of jesus we pray amen, amen.